All right, welcome back from lunch, everybody. Um, so there's a question, what's the difference between development and production? It was a term that I tossed around earlier, but didn't really explain what it meant. So what I mean by that is there are two different environments in which your code will run. So imagine we have two servers, which I'll draw as these rectangles. We have our production and our development servers. And so when we are on our computer over here, Um, and we write code, we're writing code that we see in whatever, and we can choose to push it to Git, right? Or push it wherever we want. Um, and say, like, GitHub ha is a cloud over here. We can push the code over to GitHub, where it just lives and doesn't do anything. Or we can push it to a server where it'll actually run. Like, you know how we run it on our computer, and it creates our local host? And we can visit that like it's a web page? We could also run it on a server, which will serve pages to other people. And so if we push the code to dev, like a server here, and actually run that code, now that code is sitting there listening for requests. So just like we can visit a local server on our computer, we can, all vis we can also visit a server on the internet. And remember when I say internet, it means just an interconnected network. And so how do we access that code? How do we access a server on the internet? Does anybody know? So if I said, go visit your friend's dorm, how do you get there? You have an address, right? Like maybe it's 32 Mill Street, which is Winthrop House, and then a room, whatever. And so that would be like me saying, I want to go visit Google.com. What's Google's .com address? Do you know what addresses are on the internet, what they're called? Yeah, they'll have an IP address. And then so something a DNS server will look up for you the actual IP address of Google.com and say, all right, go to this IP address. And so just like you would go visit your friend in Winthrop, your request can go visit a server online. Does that make sense? Yes, no? And so maybe they're dev servers. <coughs> and maybe the IP address to that dev server is only accessible within a certain network. And maybe that network is Google.com. And so they can test whatever code they want on their development servers, but nobody outside of people working for Google within that building will be able to access that code. And so that code is relatively safe. You can assume that no users are going to try to hack into it because they don't have access. You can assume data is good. It can crash and it's no big deal, just because it's only for people within Google. And to, you can think of it as like a sandbox. Whereas the production server has access to the whole world, and anybody can visit it. So it's more of a public IP address rather than a private IP address. And so this production server is where actually www.google.com is. And so it will visit this, a public one, public to everybody in the world, whereas this one is private. And so when you visit www.google.com, it'll visit this server. And nobody can visit this server unless they're actually working for Google. So you actually push the same code over here, and it will run on this server. Do you have a question? <coughs> like a, like a or like yeah, so this is a testing environment. And this is the, like, I don't know what a synonym is, but it's out there in the real world. OK. So like when we were writing in our code a while ago, mm -hmm. um, where you had like, a, like a two different kind of areas yeah. for dev and Mm -hmm. um, was it like what? Why was there in the same kind of document? I think it was, was it. Yeah. Kind of yeah. Document? So as I write code, I don't want to have to say, "All right, this code is for the development server." Now let me copy and paste that code over here, change a few things, and then have that in a separate thing that I push over to the production server. I just want to say I have one repo on my computer, and I can either push it to GitHub, where it just sits there and doesn't do anything. I can push it to a dev server where it'll run, but only be accessible to people within my network. Or I can push it to the production server, and it'll be accessible to everybody in the world. And so I don't want to have to keep track of three different versions of my code, like living everywhere, different places on my computer, and keep track, oh, I need to add this to this file, whatever. Because Git already does that for us. And so we can say, I have a branch for our production. I have a branch for the dev. 
and I've just pushed everything to GitHub so it lives there and I don't lose it if my computer like gets thrown in the ocean or something. And so since I don't want to keep track of different versions, the only way that the code knows whether it's running on a production or a dev server is a special flag that you set on the server. And that's called an environment variable. So you'll eventually convert it to like, like a development environment variable to like a production environment variable? Or? Yeah, so just on the developments on the server, you know how you can set variables like in a C file or a JavaScript file or whatever? You can also set variables on a server. And so you could do node n. equals development here, and node n equals production here. Okay. And so when the code runs, it'll know where it is, and it might ha have slightly different performance. OK. So like, um, when you're kind of uh, already tested the code in the mm -hmm. development environment, and you want to have it go to the production environment, then we would convert like EV into PRE. Um, so this is stored on the server itself, not in our code. In our oh, code, we'll say, okay. hey, what am I running on, and how do I get it? Okay. And so the, in order to access these variables, um, you can do it in JavaScript by doing like some call that will grab the environment. But this node env1 is a special flag. And if you do app.get env, it will look in the actual server's environment and grab this variable. <coughs> Does that make sense? Okay. Anybody un still unsure about production versus development versus GitHub versus your local computer? Because your local computer also throws up a server that was only accessible to you or others network to you. The hand? Yeah, so the production server might be a server farm. It might be a single server. It might be my laptop that I expose to the world. Um, it's just, you can think of it as just a computer connected to the rest of the world. And in a dev, it's just your computer? Same exact thing, but it's only accessible to certain people. Um, so in CS50, we talked about IP addresses. And on the quiz, there was a question about, like, what's the difference between a private and a public IP address? And so private IP addresses are only accessible to those on your own network, meaning you have to be like physically or via Wi-Fi connected to the other computer. So I connect to other people's laptops? Yeah. yeah. If we're, um, the Harvard network might actually block some of these things, but say we're all chilling at my house and we're all connected to my router, I could access any of your computers. Um, I won't get into how, but <laughs> it's possible. If you're on the same network, you can. So your computer has a host name, and I just say hostname.local, give it a port, and it'll actually access it. I wish I could demo, but we're on the Harvard network, so. Yeah? So does that mean if I'm, I don't know, like at a small cafe, and I log into wellsfargo.com, and there's someone there who's like as smart as you? <laughs> <laughs> Um, whoever controls the router controls oh, okay. so your internet. Control the so if they had access to the router, then yes, they could like look at all of your packets and steal your password. Um, so you're just blindly trusting whoever the owner of the cafe is that they're not going to be doing that. And so the way that we ensure that everything that we do is encrypted is by using a VPN. And so if you look at CS50's lecture where we talk about VPNs, David will dive into that a little more. But that is definitely a worry, and that's why I would recommend that you all get on the Harvard VPN and then use it if you're like in a public location that you don't trust. Any questions about this sort of stuff, though? So it's basically it's the same exact code. So just like I have my Git repo and I push to the GitHub and you guys pull it, you can just imagine the production and dev servers are just pulling my code and then instantly running it. Does that make sense? And I can just say, production, don't pull my code until I tell you, like, it's production ready. Development, pull it whenever you want and just try to run it. If it breaks, 
annoying, but it's not the end of the world. And so we can sandbox and test whatever. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, the development server isn't necessary. Not everywhere has a big server farm that you can just test on. For most people, just running on your local computer is sufficient. But if you really want to make sure it works in an environment other than your computer, you would push it to some remote server. <coughs> is that clear for everyone? All right, and so we talked about these things a lot last lecture, never really talked about what they were, but now we'll talk, be talking about databases. So what is a database? What does it do? Does anybody have any intuition? Data. Yeah, it stores data. It just allows us to have data that s survives, it's persistent. If it, the database server crashes, it's still there because it's stored on a hard drive somewhere. It keeps data organized and allows us to access and manage that data. So when we push something into a database, it's optimized for keeping track of your data and returning it to you as fast as possible. And that's nearly all it does. And so because of that, it needs to stay very, very organized and create um, a lot of optimization algorithms that allow it to fetch your data as fast as possible. And we talked about this word a lot, CRUD. What does it stand for? Create, read or retrieve, update, and delete or destroy. And so there are a lot of databases out there. Can anybody name a few? SQL, SQL is not actually a database, but MySQL or SQLite is. Uh, SQLite, if you took CS50 this year, you used. If you used it, took CS50 in past years, you might have used MySQL. What other databases have you heard of? Any? MongoDB, MongoDB that's another big one. Firebase is Google's like API service and has some sort of database, yeah? NumPy? That's the Python library, I think. I don't, I don't think it actually stores data for you. <coughs> but there are other ones like Redis or PostgreSQL or um, a bunch of others. On a hard drive somewhere. So um, databases are actually just programs. And if you install MongoDB on your own computer, then it will create stuff on your own hard drive that makes the data persistent. And it will keep track of indexes and be able to grab it for you super quickly. And like if you have a lot of money, then you could actually have your own server with only a database running on it. And so like its computer is, or its CPU is dedicated only to like any data maintenance that it might need to do. And so you might see like if you're spinning up an AWS server or Rackspace or something like that, they'll have servers that are optimized only for being database servers. Um, but if you don't have a ridiculous amount of money, you might just want to run it on your own computer, which is totally fine and will work. And how do you like, like um, allow like the user to have access to the data on the computer? Is it just stored there? Um, I'll get to that in a little bit. And by in a little bit, I mean right now. Um, so ORMs or ODMs, has anybody heard this, these acronyms? It stands for Object Relational Mapping or Object Document Mapping. And what it does is it makes it easier for a user to get at the data that they want. Meaning it represents data as objects with methods to better fit like the object-oriented programming model or like the prototype. So you remember how when we create an array where we have access to things like array.push, array.slice, array.length, stuff like that. So it makes it much easier to work with the arrays rather than having to do things yourself. And so this will create your models as objects, which allows you to do something like user.create or user.save rather than having to do some low-level thing. So who has used SQL before? Almost all of you. So does everybody know what this means? So insert into our user's database in the column's name and age, values Jordan and 22. So if you are new to computer science, this might be a little bit scary, right? Writing SQL is really scary for people the first time. But something like this is a lot easier, right? User.create, name Jordan, age 22. So this is an example of, I think it's called SQLize, which is a library for, it's a ORM for a SQL that allows you to use it in Node.js. And so things like this allow you to use what looks like normal JavaScript, 
rather than writing SQL yourself. And so you may have heard a couple words thrown around like relational, document-based, key value pair, graph, and these are all types of databases. Uh, has anybody heard of these terms or know what they mean? So relational databases store information in tables, so you can think of it as a massive Excel spreadsheet. Whereas document-based databases store things like as JSON, so it looks exactly like a JavaScript object. Uh, relational, in order to get at your data, you have to use a language called SQL, whereas document-based, you just query for an object. So like ID equals this, and then you search for that, and it'll return it to you. <coughs> Robust versus flexible. So relational, since you have to force items into a table, you have to make sure that each uh, item that you want to add fits up with a column, and the types match. And it has to be perfect like that, otherwise it will throw away the data, or just not accept it. Whereas with document-based, what can you put in an array? Or not an array, an object. Anything you want, really. So you just create an object, throw it in your database, and it persists. So you're very, very flexible when it comes to document base. Uh, relations versus isolation. So in a relational database, you have a bunch of col uh, columns and a bunch of tables, and you can join them together to create more complex data. And so the whole basis between relational databases is that ability to create relations between tables and be between rows and columns. Whereas document-based, it's more isolated. So each object is just its own object. And everything that you might want to do with that object is all stored together with it. Uh, is everybody good on this slide? So what are some advantages of relational databases? Can anybody think of any? <coughs> SQL, you get access to SQL, which is that a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> Probably a good thing if you are used to using SQL. It allows you to create really complicated queries. Um, so maybe something that you might have even thought of querying for, you could do that with a complex join. Um, and you can join the tables, which is linking them, using arbitrary functions, anything you want. You also have more effective data analysis, since you can join any table to another table and see, like, oh, how does this relation look? And you have forced integrity of data, which means because it's a very, very strict table, you know exactly what you're, what you're going to get when you pull from a row. Does that make sense to everyone? And so what are some advantages of document-based databases? Simplicity. All you have to do is create an object and toss it in. Scalability and sharding. So it's very easy to scale a relational, or I mean a document-based database because you just get another hard drive. And since everything is stored together in the same object, you don't have to like cross hard drives in order to pull a single object. Whereas if you're joining tables, maybe this table's here, another table's on a different hard drive, and you have to access both those hard drives in order to get at that full joined table. And sharding is just the term that means you can split up a database onto multiple hard drives. It's very flexible. Again, you just throw things into an object and throw it into the database. It's insanely fast, because what does it need to do in order to grab your object? You just need to look it up and grab it, right? As opposed to relational databases where you grab the row, see if there are any relations, go grab those relations, see if they have relations, grab those. So it might be more time consuming if you're using a relational model. So less processing, because you just grab the object, that's all you need. So less cost. You can run this on your own computer. You don't need very optimized servers for this. And it, you're allowed to use multi-dimensional data types, so like arrays, objects within objects. And so that creates additional flexibility and ease of use. So is everybody clear on relational versus document-based? Other database types exist, but they're beyond the scope of this class and not as popular as either one of these. So which is better? Well, it really depends what you're doing. And so I'm going to test your knowledge. So which one should we use if we're a big data company that does analytics? So relational, why? 
yeah, it's easy to analyze the data. You can create relations between tables arbitrarily. Like, oh, who knows if this table relates to this? Let's find out. Whereas with Mongo, it would be very hard to do. What about we're a startup and we want a prototype ready as soon as possible? Document-based, why? It's cheaper, it's quick, it's flexible. If you want to change it, you can. We expect a lot of data, but we don't want to spend a ton of money. Document base, why? Cheaper. It's cheaper, yeah. It can run anywhere, yeah. <coughs> We're a bank and our data integrity is crucial. Relational. I decay what I'm doing. <laughs> what should I use? Probably document based, probs. <laughs> it's easy. And so which do you think we should use for what we're doing? And why? I hear a few relationals, a few document based, why, why not? So who thinks relational? Who thinks document based? So why would we choose relational? What advantages are good for us? Yeah. Because you have like categories for a certain like uh, different like classes, I guess. Like, yeah. Yeah, so because of these tag things, we might want to use relational because it's easy to create relations between tags. Um, yeah, Your intuition? Just picking out, like, um, especially for reviewing scenarios, like, a lot of things in, first of all, like, one table for, like, users, like, you're going to have to compile, like, all the admin together. That's probably easier with SQL queries. Like, just using SQL is probably just much easier. Um, so when it comes to querying, for simple queries like that, if you're just querying for people whose is admin is true, it's equally easy in both SQL and searching by object. So like, like expiration dates, for instance. So expiration dates. So you can still, like with um, document base, you can still search for expiration dates before this date. The hard thing would be like, well, if we only have two tables, the relation, there aren't many things to relate to each other. So it would be much easier to do analytics within your own table. It's more like if you have 50,000 tables and you want to create random relations between those. That's when it starts getting um, much easier to do with SQL. Any other advantages of if we did this relationally? Even if you thought document base is better, there are still advantages of doing it relationally. All right, how about arguments for doing it with a database or a document based data type? database. It's got a lot of hands. Don't make me c cold call. It's cheap. It's cheap. Yeah, okay. It's cheap. It's easy. Why else? <coughs> yeah. Yeah, it's very flexible. So if we want to change later, we could. Yeah. So when you're working with coupons, do we need any other information outside of what we have listed here? Not really, right? So everything that you might need to use with a single coupon is all together with that coupon. So that's starting to look like maybe an object model. And same thing with the user. If we're using a particular user, are we going to need anything other than that user? Or are there any like complex things? Like, there's not really user-to-user -user interaction at all, right? And there's hardly any user-to-coupon interaction. So that's saying we don't really need the strengths of what a relational database gives us. Because relational databases give us, gives us relations, right? If you have a chat room with user-to-user -user relations, you might want to use that with a relational database. Or a lot of users-to-coupons or coupons-to-users. We don't see much crossover between either one. So we might want that isolation that a document-based database gives us. So let's take a vote. Who wants to use a relational database? How about a document base? OK, few. My next slide depended on it. <laughs> so why we should use MongoDB? So we gave a few reasons. Um, it's, mo it's the most popular document based. I actually don't even know of another document based one. Uh, and because we have minimal interaction between objects, there's no that user to user interaction or user to coupon interaction. And so yeah. Mostly one-to-many relations between objects. Um, and I'll get into what that means. <coughs> so 
So this is, the one-to-many thing isn't as important with the coupon thing, but say for your dorm supplies stuff, what is the one-to-many relation there? One-to-many being one object stores a bunch of other objects, but not these objects don't each relate to other objects themselves. Like a one-to-one -one relation is... A many-to-many -many relation is a chat room where anybody over here can talk to anybody over here and back and forth. So there's a lot of lines going between those. Yeah. Because like, like an user will buy several objects. It's yeah. Not like one user per object. Exactly. So the one-to-many relationship is one user has a lot of purchases. But it's not like each purchase has an arbitrary number of users. So do you see why? So one-to-many relationship there. And so many-to-many -many relationships is where we want to use a relational database. So something like users will follow uh, or will like a, a Facebook page. So a lot of users will like a single page. That's a many-to-one. Many but a lot of users will like a lot of different pages. So that's a many-to-many -many relationship. Does that make sense? Cool. And so MongoDB has a... ODM associated with it called MongoJS. Uh, it's an ODM made specific, specifically for Node.js in order to interface with MongoDB. And it allows us to create schemas for data integrity. Because MongoDB, you can just throw anything in an object and throw that into the database. But we lose out on data integrity, which a relational database could give us. But if we use a library like MongoJS, it allows us to create schemas. It allows us to force our data to fit a certain integrity. Meaning we can make it seem like it's a relational database by rejecting data that we don't want to store in it. Like if we tried to store our name as a number, it would reject that data if we so chose. It has built-in validation. We can say if their username is too long, reject it. If their email is not valid, reject it. If their email is not a string, reject it. If they give me something that's not defined in our schema, ignore it. We can define methods on models. So say we want to have a user.checkPassword method. Rather than actually querying the database ourselves, we can just create a model on that. And so we can use user.checkPassword, give it a password, and we can say, oh, it'll return true or false. <coughs> we can write hooks. What is a hook? Does anybody know? It's a function that, fi that runs after an event is fired. So if you're on a web page and you click a button, it might have a hook that runs a function on it. If we try to save a user, it might have a hook that runs a function before the user saves. If we push to git, we can have a git hook that does something when it receives a push. All right, and now let's look at the code. But before we do, we have a room change tomorrow. This room is not available, and so we'll be working in Boylston 105. And I'll send out an email tonight to remind you. Uh, just tomorrow. Every other day, this room is free. Cool, so let's look at some code. <coughs> was, was there a question, comment, joke? It is a little bit closer, huh? But I don't think it's available. <laughs> all right, MongoosJS. What is this? <coughs> so it allows us to do all these things, and this is what it looks like. Mongoose, var mongoose equals require mongoose. We all know what that does, right? Mongoose.connect, this, we don't know what it does, but what do we think it does? Mongoose.connect. It connects to where the database is actually stored. Var cat is mongoose model cat name string. We don't know what that means, but can you kind of guess? Yeah, it's, it's what format we're expecting the data to look like. So we're creating essentially a table called cat, which the data should look like this. A name, that's a string. That's all it is. So var kitty is a new cat with this name. Sounds like English. Kitty save. That also sounds like English. So the nice thing about using a ODM is that the code, you can read it and kind of know what it's doing without knowing what it's doing. 
So, and then what's this? It's a callback. So if there's an error that occurs, then console log the error. Otherwise, meow. Pretty simple. Um, just interfacing directly with the database via network calls, maybe? It would be very difficult, and I don't know anybody who's just tried to do it without this. <coughs> All right. So I just pushed code a little bit earlier, um, and I wrote out our schemas. So we have coupon.txt and user.txt. Let's look at user first. So this is in the, the lectures and stuff. Repo. And so here's a list of everything that we said we should store with the user. <clears throat> and so we're going to start throwing that into a schema that will make sure that our data integrity is what we think it should be. And so also in there, I put a bare bones file that will create a schema for us. <coughs> and so we have const mongoose gets require mongoose. Const schema is mongoose.schema. So schema is a built-in method on mongoose that creates schemas for us. I have var username, user schema gets a new schema, then we get to define it. And then these are some options that if you read the documentation you'll have. Was everybody able to pull this code? Oh, you want a few seconds to resolve conflicts? Uh, make a new commit. Yeah. So just commit all of your current code and then pull. Resolve any conflicts. So go ahead and get add all of these things first. Uh, oh, man. So. Oh, so this is the only file that it's complaining about. So go ahead and um, <laughs> you'll learn to love it. So go ahead and just add, add that. In So ls, so cd dot dot ls, cd coupon dash api, and then just do git add that file, which is controller slash user, uh, one more d, and add. And you can't click. <laughs> and then go ahead and commit that and then pull. Anybody, yeah? It's just gonna like take. It's just gonna take everything from your tab, right? Um, it'll actually try to merge them. Okay, so it, I should just. Try yeah, so just. Well, you'll have to commit first because remember, it won't allow it to merge unless you have a fallback. Because I did. So make sure to add them before you. So get add all of these things, or get add coupon API, and get add this. So get add these file. Oh, just like um, here. Want me to type it for you? Thank you. 
All right. Anybody else having Git issues? A lot of people. What? Is, is what Git issues are you having? Is it just rejecting your pull? What? Yeah. So untracked file means you've added it and didn't tell Git that to add it manu Like you never told Git to add that file, so it doesn't know that that file exists. And then I might have created the same file, which would overwrite that, but Git doesn't know about it on your own computer, so it's like, I don't know what I'm doing. So please add it and commit it so that I can pull for you. And so you're going to have to do that. Git add and that file. Okay. So automatic merge is failing. Like everything's been added. Oh, because get status so you're halfway through a merge right now um, so this is this is saying um, you have unmerged paths so you, it tried to automatically merge and failed and so these are the two files that have conflicts and you fix those and then go ahead and commit that wait but i added before this i added everything how has this changed uh, so i might have changed it when i pulled or when i pushed so i have to get add get commit these uh, so go ahead and open them up and you'll Yes, um. <coughs> yeah. Um, yeah, there'll be some in slash model slash schema. Oh, okay. So LS. Yeah, so those are all the files oh, I'm working on. Okay. What? So if you go into slash models slash schemas, you should see four files that are there uh, within coupon API. Is anybody still having trouble pulling? What are the issues that you're having? I wish my eyesight were that good. <laughs> so when I try to like get commit this, I still can't read that. Hold on. All right. If you, how about this? Everybody, just reclone the direct the thing, <laughs> and then after class, I can go and do more targeted get help. How about that? So you can just do git clone that URL that's on the website. And then it'll just create a new repository for you. And then later on, I'll go help you guys each with any Git issues. Wait, it's on your website? Yeah, it's on my GitHub. Oh, OK. <coughs> it's, a, it's the same exact folder that you've been, that you cloned earlier. Just reclone it somewhere else. Don't clone it within its own folder. Otherwise, Git's going to go crazy. What do you mean? Like, yeah, that that would take up. It would take up a lot of. I would have to write up a lot of infrastructure to do that. But so no. <laughs> So um, in the root folder, slash coupon API, slash model, slash schemas. Oh, model, okay. Slash schemas. And it's the key user. So it's all the dot text and dot JS. Okay. And the ones I have open is user.js and user.txt. Just re reclone for now, and I'll go help you guys later. Oh, so it just has yeah, a bunch so of. Yeah, so your code, my code up here, and your code over here. So it's the exact same thing. <laughs> <laughs> It'll work. <Yeah. coughs> All right. Anybody still having trouble getting this code? Git clone and then the URL. 
<coughs> I should have devoted the data get Uh, yeah, if you want to come on Saturday, we can have an all-day seminar. That was a joke. Don't come. <laughs> don't come. <coughs> What's it complaining about? Oh, I don't even know. Like, you put like the repository. Uh, no, just. Just the. Yeah, just the URL. You can cut. Yeah, cut. Don't have the carrots. Oh, I see. <laughs> Everybody, have the repo. Was that a no or a now? That was a no. Okay. Uh, are you are you trying to reclone or are you trying to? Yeah. Just if you're having trouble with Git, just abort. Don't run Git. Clone abort. No. I'm just, uh, um, yeah. Git rebase abort. Uh, just reclone the repo and then I'll go help you guys resolve conflicts after. But is everybody able to find these files? It's located in the boot. Camp, I think it's called slash coupon API slash model slash schemas, and these two files are user.js and user.txt. What? What? <laughs> oh, so you just you clone the entire repo? So just just this one? Oh, I see. Anybody else having trouble? This is in slash coupon API slash model slash schemas. I don't know. I stole it from somebody online. All right, anybody want me to wait? Okay. So user.txt is this list here just typed out. Um, so it's all the things that we thought we should save with the user. And so now we're going to go ahead and create the schema that Mongoose will match all of our incoming input to. And so on the left, we have some boilerplate code that I wrote that creates a schema for us. <coughs> so top two lines are importing Mongoose and then stealing its schema method. And then we define its schema. So if we look at the mongoose documentation, we have defining our schema. Uh, this code is almost exactly what we have, but you say new schema, you give it whatever you want it to ha hold, you give it data types for them, and then that's it. There are additional things that you can have. Um, if you see, Mongoose automatically creates a couple fields for you, created at and updated at. I don't see it anywhere. But we can rename it using the option that I already wrote, this one here. So this says, instead of storing it as created at, we want to call it created date and updated date. But then let's go ahead and start defining our schema. Is everybody OK? Yes? Stop me at any time if I'm like, if I skip something you thought was crucial, or if you want me to re-explain anything, because I'm totally happy to. And so what do we want to have in here? We're almost cutting and pasting the copy, what we have up here into that file, right? I want to have first name, which is a string, right? Everybody with me? We want what else? Last name, which is of type string. What else? Address, which is of type 
string. <coughs> what else? Classier, which is of type string number, probably number, email, which is of type string. Phone, which is of type who says number? Who says string? Why string over number? Yeah. Yeah, you might have something, but let's say we're going to standardize it into just a 10 digit number. Yeah. Yeah, if you have any leading zeros, you want to have it as a string, otherwise, the number will ignore those. So we should use that as a string. Uh, we have phone provider, which will be stored as string. Lots of strings. Venmo username, string. Is admin, boolean. Every single data type would work here, almost. But boolean is the most efficient. <coughs> Is super admin, same thing. Hash. What is a hash? Uh, string. string. Does everybody know what a hash is? It's just an encrypted password. So instead of storing the password in plain text, we're going to store it in a garbled text so that if somebody steals our database, they don't have everyone's password. Company name. String, created date, we don't have to do because Mongo does it for us. Same thing with updated date. What about interests, which is tags? What do you want to store this as? Array. Array of strings. And time spent. We could do a date time. We could keep track in seconds. We can keep track in however we want. Um, let's call it minutes and just store it as a number. <coughs> Are everybody with me? So that is our schema. And so if you remember back from CS50 and you were creating tables, you had the option to say, make something required. How do you think, do you think, first of all, do you think that MongoDB or this library has the ability to do that? Surely. So we could Google it. Uh, So all schema types, um, you can add a required property. And so we can just say required to anyone. So which one should be required? First name, last name. I would say we don't need their first name and last name. We could, we could survive without it. Address, we could survive without Venmo. So this is the coupons one. So we don't actually need their Venmo. Hash is probably required. So now we have to call it type string required true as an object. <coughs> I would say phone number is probably important if we're going to be texting them. Probably also the provider.
Um, we could just say, if we don't add anything to it is admin, we can just assume it's false. Oh, and I think I heard a question, why are we storing their phone provider? Is because if we want to email them a text, we need to know their provider. That's pretty good, right? Anything else we need? Not really. Um, so I would say we don't actually need a hash, because if you're a normal user, you're not going to store a password. So we don't actually require that to be true. We only require it to be true if you're an admin. And so we'll check for that before we save it, but we don't need to require all users to have a hash. Do we need to require admins to have a phone number? Probably not, right? Like if you're a business who wants to add a coupon, we don't need your phone number. So we can actually delete that and just say, nope. So we don't actually have any strictly required fields. <laughs> but now you know how to add required fields if you want. <coughs> But we still want to make sure that if an admin tries to sign up, they will need a hash. If a, user, a normal user wants to sign up, they will still need a phone number and provider. Yeah? I'll show you in right now. Um, so what if we needed to have a requirement for some users but not others? We would have to check something before we saved it. And so I talked briefly about hooks before. Does anybody remember what they are? Yeah, it's a function that is called when something happens, and it just listens for something to happen. And so we have here username.presave this function. So that means before we save something, before we put it into the database, run this code. Does that make sense? So what might we want to run? Any guesses? Yeah? Yeah, check if they're an admin, and if so, make sure they have a password. So if this dot is admin, do some stuff, else do some other stuff. And so why can I use this here? <coughs> what does this mean? Yeah, exactly. So the reason I can use this here is because this function is invoked on a particular object, on a particular user. And so this gets set to that user's object. And so we can check this dot is admin, and that will get that is admin field from the particular user that we're checking. What if they don't have an is admin field? It gets set to undefined, which is falsy. Make sense? So what do we want to check? So if they're an admin, what do we want to check? Yeah? Yeah, that they have a password. So ensure they have a password. So if they don't have dot hash, then throw new error, which means just error and exit. And we can even give it a message. <coughs> and so let's be a little more flexible. We can call it a hash or we can call it a password and say if there's not this.password. So if this they supply this.password but not this.hash, we can just say, okay, we'll be flexible and use that password for your hash. How would we do that? Yeah? Oh, correct. Good call. So 
So if they don't supply either a password or a hash, then exit. Otherwise, it means they gave us one of them. And so how do we say use either one of them, whichever one's correct, to be this.hash? Um, so when we create this schema, we assume that an object is getting passed to the schema. And then it will check to make sure that the object that's passed adheres to the standard that we create. Does that make sense? Does everybody know what a schema is? Does, every, does, anybody, does everybody know what we're trying to do here? Because if not, let me know, and I will explain it in great detail. Yeah, so remember, like in here, when you create a new instance of a cat, you pass it an object. And that object will get matched against the schema to make sure, like, did, it give, did they give us a name that's a string? And if so, then we'll accept it as a new object in our database. Otherwise, we'll reject it. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. So it's like the schema folder is um, like where the database is, or like where code is going to be that. Like, how do, what is the schema folder for? It, we're defining what each object should look like. Because MongoDB is very flexible and it will accept anything to the database, but we only want a certain we only want certain things to go into the database. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So we're defining. Okay. We're just defining the canonical uh, type of a user. What it, what does it look like? Okay. So for APIs, um, it's a folder for you to like um, the controllers. Are these all kind of like the names that you set, or how does, or what's in, or do you just you just like uh, arbitrarily chose like to name the controllers and the folders, and all the folders within the. Um, oh, why why did I put them? Yeah, like under. What's the, the directory structure? Folders. Okay, um, so the question was. Why did I choose this directory structure? Um, and the answer to that question is, so everything in the root folder are things that will get run and that need to get run. Like package.json, you need to get run, like globally, right? And the server itself also needs to get run globally. <coughs> and then everything else I split up into different folders for organizational reasons. So we have controllers, which keeps track of all of our logic. And we have models, which keeps track of all of our um, like information. Um, so we'll talk about model view controller in a couple of days, which is another like way of the way you should think about how to organize everything. And so we try to keep our logic and our like hard coded values separate. And so the logic is called the controllers, models is what's the info. And so I split up controllers to hold every all the um, files that hold any logic and models for any files that hold information. Okay. So, but hypothetically, if all of these files were in the, the main folder, it would still run? Uh, we would have to update where the require links point, but yeah. This is just me trying to stay organized. I could have, I could have put everything all into one big file, and it would work perfectly. But it would just be a pain in the butt to uh, maintain. Uh, do you have, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the reason I'm doing that is because uh, because I want to be able to be a little bit more flexible for our user. So if they accidentally forget that like password is actually called hash, they might pass password in. And so I'm just going to be say nice and say, if they passed me, oh, I didn't save the code. Wait, can you just use it? Like, can you 
So when I say user, I mean the person using our schema, meaning the developer. Ah. Uh, Yeah. So I'm saying when we later down the line forget that hash is called hash oh, okay. and we want to pass it password, it won't throw an error. Yeah? Are the time like that too? Like the password are in the hash too? Uh not yet. We'll do that in a second. Okay. <coughs> yeah. So why not just call it password? Um we could because it's not actually a password, it is a hash. Okay. But we could if we wanted to. Because we have to store a hash in the database um, as determined by the schema. And I just want to make sure that if we pass it a hash, it'll work. So let's just make sure if, if we're forgetful and we pass it a hash or we pass it a password, it doesn't matter either way. Because we will set this.hash to be whichever one of those values was supposed to be. So this.hash or this.password. <coughs> Does that make sense? Are there any questions? Are there any doubts? Like if you can raise anything with me, I'm pretty chill. No? Yeah. So um, on line, I don't know what line it is anymore, but uh -huh. it's down. Yep. Um, we created a module to model. Yeah. Um, can you explain what a schema is and what a model is? Or like how they relate? So a model is, so a schema is what we define to be like our types, like what are we expecting? And a model is what is the object that Mongoose actually uses. So this converts our defined schema into a model that has all of the properties and methods that Mongoose needs to work internally. Yeah, you can think of it that way. Yeah. Exactly. So we wrote the blueprint here. But if we did user schema.save, there's no such thing, right? Until we create the, until we export it. Does this make sense to everyone? It'll make sense more. So we only do this once, and then we just use it for the rest of the time. Um, so this isn't something that you'll be writing over and over and over. Every project, you do this one time, and then you're done. <clears throat> so at this line here, is hash hashed yet? No, it's still in plain text, right? So we should hash the hash. So hash. Um, we can do it manually. There are also libraries that allow us to do that. But for now, let's just say to do, uh, to do. We'll do it a little later. <coughs> but just don't forget to do that. Otherwise, it'll be stored in plain text. All right, is there anything else we need to check for our users? Or our admins? No? What about for our non-admins? What do we require from our non-admins? Uh, phone number, yeah. So if not this dot phone. <coughs> um, throw an error. What else? Yeah, check for provider. dot phone provider uh, 
Uh, so Tiff, go ahead and pull from the repo, and then we're working in coupon API slash model slash schemas. This work for everyone? What else? We should make sure the phone number is actually a phone number, right? So how do we do that? Presumably there's a library. We can worry about it later. We could write our own function. If you took CS50 this year, you already wrote the function. Um, but we can just call this another to-do. <coughs> Anything else we need to check for? Not really, right? No? So we can say, okay, that's done. And then callback we, is just part of the documentation. You have to call the callback. And then we can add models if we want, methods. So right now I have a greet method, which does what? Yeah, it just logs hi. How do we get it to say hi, whatever the user's first name is? Yeah. What happens if this dot first name doesn't exist? Will it error? Yeah, it'll just say hi undefined. What other methods might we want to check? Um, we don't really care. This is just an example oh, one. <coughs> How about comparing their password against their hash password? For now, it's pretty easy, right? User, schema. What should this do? So we have user schemas.methods dot check password, which is a method which will check a password that's passed against the user's actual password. So right now it's pretty easy, right? The password's in plain text, so how do we check it? Anyone? If dot hash equals pw, right? Then what? True. Else. Turn false, right? Or written more simply, return that. <coughs> Can everybody read that? Um, 
So the question for the microphone is, why are we doing all this validation within the schema rather than just doing it at the endpoint where we create a user? Um, the answer to that is, you should always do it as close to the actual addition as possible. Because say somebody gets into our server, or say we hire a new developer who doesn't really know what they're doing and just does a user.save somewhere else in a different endpoint then they might add bad data into our database. And so this is the very last step before it gets put into our database. And so there's nowhere else that we could inject bad data. Does that make sense? We'll also do validation on the back end, and we'll also do validation on the front end. But you just want validation everywhere. Oh, so meaning can they give us a password that's code that we might accidentally run and do bad things? So no, that's specific to SQL, oh. SQL injection. Yeah, it's screw SQL. <laughs> Is everybody comfortable with where we are? Yes, no? If I hear no no's, I'm just going to forge ahead. All right, good enough. All right, so now let's start using our user one. <coughs> uh, that was, I meant coupon. All right, so same exact boilerplate code as before, and now we have these things to do. So work with the person next to you and try to get the schema coded together. Ready, go. Feel free to work in groups of more than two for now. Do you want me to get you caught up? So do you know... Mm -hmm. um, I think I kind of understand the difference between Okay. Okay. Hold on, let me mute my mic so this doesn't get...
All right, how's it going? Is everybody able to have some stuff in here? Were there any hooks that you had to check? Yeah, you could, you could have a hook that checks the start date and expiry date to see if they're within what you expect. But there's nothing you really strictly need to check. So there aren't really any required hooks. But let's go ahead and define the schema. <coughs> so we have name. is a string, right? What do we have for URL? String, company name, string. Start date is a date. Oh, we didn't talk about dates, but I was hoping you would look it up. <laughs> End date is also a date. Tags is array of strings. Clicks number. Any other possibilities? <coughs> you could also have an array of dates, which gives you further analytics. What about views? Same thing, array of dates. Redeems. Same thing. Posted by. Who looked this one up? Yeah, so it's referencing another person. So it could do schema.object ID. So you had to look that one up if you were curious. Um, approved date. Date. Created date. Date. Updated date. Date. Well, actually, um, Mongo does that for us <coughs> down here. Um, and we're only keeping track of the latest update, though we could have an array of dates there as well. All right, does everybody have something similar to this? All right, was there anything in the hook? No, yeah? Um, there are two different ways to do it. We could have a default one, or we could just set it in the hook. So let's actually just set that in the hook. So if they don't give us something. Start date. Then what do we want to do? Mm -hmm. Yep. If they don't give us a start date, just declare it to be now. <coughs> so we could have also done this with the default value up there, but we'll go ahead and do it in the hook. All right, is there anything that's required? Anything? Anybody want an empty coupon? You should probably know what the coupon is, right? So we want this to be type string um, required true. Anything else? URL probably anything else? <coughs> we should probably definitely keep track to who it was posted by, so we could have that be required as well.
Mm-hmm. Yeah, because the question was, why in the user schema did we check to make sure the required attributes were there in the pre-save hook versus now we're just doing it in the schema? And the answer is because there are two types of users. There's admins and there's normal users. And the admins, you needed some subset of the properties, and the normal users, you needed a different subset. And so we had to do that in the hook. Good question. Everybody good up to this point? Yeah? Good. All right. Um, so would you rather forge ahead like this, or would you rather try to start applying this to the other, the, your project, the dorm room supplies? Meaning, I'll keep coding here, or do you guys want more hands-on experience? Do you feel ready to tackle this on your own project? Yeah? Yeah, we'll, we'll get up to this point then. If you finish, then we can reconvene. And... It would be very, very similar. Yeah. So how about work on that until about half of you are done, and then we'll reconvene? All right. <laughs>